thevoicebeforethevoid.net. When Twilight Falls on the Stump Lots by Charles G. D. Roberts Read by The Voice Before the Void The wet, chill first of the spring, its blackness made tender by the lilac wash of the afterglow, lay upon the high, open stretches of the stump lots. The winter-whitened stumps, the sparse patches of juniper and bay just budding, the rough-mossed hillocks, the harsh boulders here and there up-thrusting from the soil, the swampy hollows wherein a coarse grass began to show green, all seemed anointed, as it were, to an ecstasy of peace by the chrism of that paradisal color. Against the lucid immensity of the April sky, the thin tops of five or six soaring ram-pikes aspired like violet flames. Along the skirts of the stump lots, a fir wood reared a ragged crested wall of black against the red amber of the horizon. Late that afternoon, beside a juniper thicket not far from the center of the stump lots, a young black-and-white cow had given birth to her first calf. The little animal had been licked assiduously by the mother's caressing tongue till its color began to show of a rich, dark red. Now it had struggled to its feet, and, with its disproportionately long, thick legs braced wide apart, was beginning to nurse. Its blunt, wet muzzle and thick lips tugged eagerly, but somewhat blunderingly as yet, at the unaccustomed teats, and its tail lifted, twitching with delight, as the first warm streams of mother milk went down its throat. It was a pathetically awkward, unlovely little figure, not yet advanced to that youngling winsomeness which is the heritage, to some degree and at some period, of the infancy of all the kindreds that breathe upon the earth. But to the young mother's eyes it was the most beautiful of things. With her head twisted far around, she nosed and licked its heaving flanks as it nursed, and between deep, ecstatic breathings she uttered in her throat low murmurs, unspeakably tender, of encouragement and caress. The delicate but pervading flood of sunset color had the effect of blending the ruddy-hued calf into the tones of the landscape. But the cow's insistent blotches of black and white stood out sharply, refusing to harmonize. The drench of a violet light was of no avail to soften their staring contrasts. They made her vividly conspicuous across the whole breadth of the stump lots, to eyes that watched her from the forest coverts. The eyes that watched her, long, fixedly, hungrily, were small and red. They belonged to a lank she-bear, whose gaunt flanks and rusty coat proclaimed a season of famine in the wilderness. She could not see the calf, which was hidden by a hillock and some juniper scrub, but its presence was very legibly conveyed to her by the mother's solicitous watchfulness. After a motionless scrutiny from behind the screen of fir branches, the lean bear stole noiselessly forth from the shadows into the great wash of a violet light. Step by step, and very slowly, with the patience that endures because confident of its object, she crept toward that oasis of mothering joy in the vast emptiness of the stump lots. Now crouching, now crawling, turning to this side and to that, taking advantage of every hollow, every thicket, every hillock, every aggressive stump. Her craft succeeded in eluding even the wild and menacing watchfulness of the young mother's eyes. The spring had been a trying one for the lank she-bear. Her den, in a dry tract of hemlock wood some furlongs back from the stump lots, was a snug little cave under the uprooted base of a lone pine, which had somehow grown up among the alien hemlocks, 
only to draw down upon itself at last, by its superior height, the fury of a passing hurricane. The winter had contributed but scanty snowfall to cover the bare inner sleep, and the March thaws, unseasonably early and ardent, had called her forth to activity weeks too soon. Then frosts had come with belated severity, sealing away the budding tubers, which are the bear's chief dependence for spring diet, and worst of all, a long stretch of intervale meadow by the neighboring river, which had once been rich in ground nuts, had been plowed up the previous spring and subjected to the producing of oats and corn. When she was feeling the pinch of meager rations, and when the fat which a liberal autumn of blueberries had laid upon her ribs was getting as shrunken as the last snow in the thickets, she gave birth to two hairless and hungry little cubs. They were very blind and ridiculously small to be born of so big a mother, and having so much growth to make during the next few months, their appetites were immeasurable. They tumbled and squealed and tugged at their mother's teats, and grew astonishingly, and made huge haste to cover their bodies with fur of a soft and silken black, and all this vitality of theirs made a strenuous demand upon their mother's milk. There were no more bee trees left in the neighborhood. The long wanderings which she was forced to take in her search for roots and tubers were in themselves a drain upon her nursing powers. At last, reluctant though she was to attract the hostile notice of the settlement, she found herself forced to hunt on the borders of the sheep pastures. Before all else in life was it important to her that these two tumbling little ones in the den should not go hungry. Their eyes were open now, small and dark and whimsical, their ears quaintly large and inquiring for their roguish little faces. Had she not been driven by the unkind season to so much hunting and foraging, she would have passed near all her time rapturously in the den under the pine root, fondling those two soft miracles of her world. With the killing of three lambs, at widely scattered points so as to mislead retaliation, things grew a little easier for the harassed bear, and presently she grew bolder in tampering with the creatures under man's protection. With one swift, secret blow of her might paw, she struck down a young ewe which had strayed within reach of her hiding place. Dragging her prey deep into the woods, she fared well upon it for some days, and was happy with her growing cubs. It was just when she had begun to feel the fasting which came upon the exhaustion of this store that, in a hungry hour, she sighted the conspicuous markings of the black and white cow. It is altogether unusual for the black bear of the eastern woods to attack any quarry so large as a cow, unless under the spur of fierce hunger or fierce rage. The she-bear was powerful beyond her fellows. She had the strongest possible incentive to bold hunting, and she had lately grown confident beyond her want. Nevertheless, when she began her careful stalking of this big game which she coveted, she had no definite intention of forcing a battle with the cow. She had observed that cows, accustomed to the protection of man, would at times leave their calves asleep and stray off some distance in their pasturing. She had even seen calves left all by themselves in a field from morning till night, and had wondered at such negligence in their mothers. Now she had a confident idea that sooner or later the calf would lie down to sleep, and the young mother roam a little wide in search of the scant young grass. Very softly, very self-effacingly, she crept nearer step by step, following up the wind, till at last, undiscovered, she was crouching behind a thick patch of juniper, on the slope of a little hollow not ten paces distant from the cow and the calf. By this time the tender violet light was fading to a grayness over hillock and hollow, and with the deepening of the twilight the faint breeze, which had been breathing from the northward, shifted suddenly and came in slow, warm pulsations out of the south. At the same time the calf, having nursed sufficiently and feeling his baby legs tired of the weight they had not yet learned to carry, laid himself down. 
On this, the cow shifted her position. She turned half round and lifted her head high. As she did so, a scent of peril was borne in upon her fine nostrils. She recognized it instantly. With a snort of anger, she sniffed again, then stamped a challenge with her forehooves and leveled the lance points of her horns toward the menace. The next moment her eyes, made keen by the fear of love, detected the black outline of the bear's head through the coarse screen of the juniper. Without a second's hesitation, she flung up her tail, gave a short bellow, and charged. The moment she saw herself detected, the bear rose upon her hindquarters. Nevertheless, she was in a measure surprised by the sudden blind fury of the attack. Nimbly she swerved to avoid it, aiming at the same time a stroke with her mighty forearm, which, if it had found its mark, would have smashed her adversary's neck. But as she struck out, in the act of shifting her position, a depression of the ground threw her off balance. The next instant, one sharp horn caught her slantingly in the flank, ripping its way upward and inward, while the mad impact threw her upon her back. Grappling, she had her assailant's head and shoulders in a trap, and her gigantic claws cut through the flesh and sinew like knives. But at the desperate disadvantage of her position, she could inflict no disabling blow. The cow, on the other hand, though mutilated and streaming with blood, kept pounding with her whole massive weight, and with short, tremendous shocks crushing the breath from her foe's ribs. Presently, wrenching herself free, the cow drew off for another battering charge, and as she did so, the bear hurled herself violently down the slope and gained her feet behind a dense thicket of bay shrub. The cow, with one eye blinded and the other obscured by blood, glared around for her in vain, then, in a panic of mother terror, plunged back to her calf. Snatching at the respite, the bear crouched down, craving that invisibility which is the most faithful shield of the furtive kindred. Painfully, and leaving a drenched red trail behind her, she crept off from the disastrous neighborhood. Soon the deepening twilight sheltered her. But she could not make haste, and she knew that death was close upon her. Once within the woods, she struggled straight toward the den that held her young. She hungered to die licking them. But destiny is as implacable as iron to the wilderness people, and even this was denied her. Just a half score of paces from the lair in the pine root, her hour descended upon her. There was a sudden, redder, and fuller gush upon the trail. The last light of longing faded out of her eyes, and she lay down upon her side. The merry little cubs within the den were beginning to expect her, and getting restless. As the night wore on, and no mother came, they ceased to be merry. By morning they were shivering with hunger and desolate fear. But the doom of the ancient wood was less harsh than its wont, and spared them some days of starving anguish. For about noon a pair of foxes discovered the dead mother, astutely estimated the situation, and then, with the boldness of good appetite, made their way into the unguarded den. As for the red calf, its fortune was ordinary. Its mother, for all her wounds, was able to nurse and cherish it through the night, and with morning came a searcher from the farm and took it, with the bleeding mother, safely back to the settlement. There it was tended and fattened, and within a few weeks found its way to the cool marble slabs of a city market. <laughs>